Hola a todos, muchas gracias por asistir a una de las últimas sesiones de esta Advertising Week Latam 2022. Mi nombre es Lina, soy CEO de Insider Latam. Insider es el medio de noticias que informa acerca de marketing y publicidad digital con foco en Latinoamérica. En esta ocasión tenemos el placer de entrevistar a una de las personalidades más destacadas de la industria publicitaria, Sir Martin Sorrell. Sir Martin fue fundador... That I understood. <laughs> understood that. <laughs> Sir Martin fue fundador y director ejecutivo de WPP, el grupo de servicios de publicidad y marketing más grande del mundo. En 2018 fundó un nuevo grupo de servicios publicitarios, esta vez uno digital. Actualmente es presidente ejecutivo de S4 Capital, el holding que tiene a MediaMonks y a otras 25 empresas. La entrevista la va a estar llevando a cabo Matías Stetson, director de Inside Latam. El tema que van a estar tratando es retos y adversidades que hay que superar para tener éxitos en los negocios digitales. Les prometo que va a ser sumamente interesante. Adelante, comenzamos con la entrevista. Vamos, Sir Martin, thank you so much for joining us here. Pleasure, Matías. It's obviously late in the afternoon. Everybody is exhausted, so. They've been drinking as well, I bet. Okay. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to ask you to help us analyze successful digital businesses. I wouldn't, challenging I wouldn't times. know about that. Actually. Oh, come on. You, you, you can speak of success fairly enough. Okay, so my first question is, forecasts indicate yeah. that a huge recession is coming in 2023. How do you think this will affect the advertising industry? And what are your suggestions for marketers and people working at agencies? When you say a huge recession, I mean, what, what's, what's the evidence that there's a huge recession coming? Well, the IMF is... is no, no, actually, the, the IMF is not saying that. IMF is, is actually forecasting that we'll see GDP growth next year. It won't be as much uh, as it was this year. Remember, if we, if we went back to this time last year, as we were coming towards the end of 2021, I think GDP growth forecasts were probably around four or five percent for this year. And they've, they've now come down to about two or three percent. Maybe, yeah, around global. I mean, mm -hmm. it varies if you're talking about the US or the UK or whatever it happens to be. Um, for next year, I think we're looking at about global GDP growth, about one or two percent. So a recession is technically defined as two negative G GDP quarters. So the answer is uh, probably from a global point of view, we won't have a recession, but there will be parts of the world that go into recession. So instead of sensationalizing it on the basis of huge <laughs> recession, and we're sitting here talking when the the Nasdaq was up today by 7% uh, on the back of better than expected inflation figures, still running at about 7% up on last year in the US, so still heavy inflation. Um, but you, what, what you're seeing is the market start starting to look beyond what I think is not a recession, but a slowdown in growth. Okay. And as far as the digital world is concerned, again, um, magazines or newspapers or media such as Insider and others always sensationalize what's happening. And you've got to, let, let's just go through some of the basic statistics so we know what we're talking about. So the world, the, the, the media world that this group of people uh, look at is probably this year worth about 800, 850 billion dollars. About 450, 500 billion is digital. And of that, about 220 this year will be at Google. That will be Google's ad revenues, which will be up from about 200 last year. So actually it will be up about 10% for the year. So that's number one. Number two, Meta, which has had you know, a lot of publicity, obviously, about its difficulties. It's two things. One is the focus, the investment on metaverse, 10 billion a year. Uh, and then, in addition to that, overhiring, which Mark Zuckerberg has just, just corrected. Um, 
Meta's advert revenues this year probably would be around about 115 billion, about the same as last year. Then you go to Amazon, which actually this year will be up from about 31 last year to 41. And of course, we, 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 we don't know too much about Alibaba and Tencent, but TikTok gets a lot of ink. ByteDance, its parent, probably 60 billion this year in total, of which TikTok internationally, the numbers vary, but there was a number in the FT yesterday that suggested they do about 10 billion this year, about 100% up on last year internationally. And then, of course, you, you, you talk about the other platforms that get a lot of ink, like Snap and Twitter, but they are not big in terms of what I just said. Snap is about five and a half billion, and Twitter's about four and a half billion. So you have to get this into proportion. Now, this year, all those platforms that I mentioned, plus some others, you know, the new entrants, Microsoft, Apple, Disney Plus, Netflix, just coming, uh, are all important features too. But all those platforms this year will grow by between 8 and 9%. Next year, even with the weak third quarters earnings that we've just had from Google and, or weaker, from Google and Amazon and Apple, they'll, they're forecast to grow next year by the sell side analysts, who tend to be a bit more optimistic, by about 10%. So again, coming back to your central question, long answer I know, and we haven't got a lot of time, <laughs> it's really important to get it in perspective, my view. Uh, you know, the, 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 big, the big bananas here are Google, Alphabet, Google and Alphabet, Meta and Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent and TikTok. That's the guts of it. And when you start to extrapolate what happens at Snap or Twitter, you in my, my view, you lose the plot. So slowing growth, and it, one other thing, which I think is really important. If you look at the tech companies over the last 10 years, they've grown their top line compound by about 15% per annum. The rest of the world has grown by about 5%. If you look at the forecasts for the next five years, forecast growth for tech is about 7%, and the rest of the world about 4%. That gets it into more perspective. It's not a recession. I mean, we could go into, we Take could degenerate. Oh. It is a slowdown, a significant slowdown in the rate of growth. Okay. Sorry for the length of the answer. So mortgages shouldn't be worried and overly concerned no, for the budgets. Look, within that number, so the other thing is this, analog, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking here obviously in Mexico City, I'm talking in LATAM, the average for LATAM, we were talking about this with my colleagues at Media Monks over lunch, the average digital distribution in LATAM is about 40% to digital. The average worldwide is 60%. LATAM is still a traditionally a traditional media dominated market. It hasn't morphed yet fully to a digital, to my, in my view, to a digital economy. It, it, to get to the average for the world, it would have to increase by about 50% from where it is, go from 40 to 60. This year, we may see digital as a proportion of worldwide uh, global media at about 65%. It is forecast to go by to 75% by 2025. The other thing to remember is advertising as a proportion of GDP is around 1% at the moment in the US. It will go to 1.5%, but driven solely by digital media. Analog will be flat or down. You look at ITV in the UK announced its numbers today, and the stock, or yesterday, the stock got hit quite badly by it. It said, despite the World Cup, ITV, which is a network analog television operation, basically, its ad revenues will be flat this year. So when you look at next year, when the ad market probably as a whole will grow by, let's say, somewhere between four or five, maybe three to four, five percent, digital will grow by 10, 
analog will be flat. And you know, the, the issue that even the network television, you know, you've seen it here in Mexico with what's happened with Univision and what's happened with Escarga here, what you'll see it probably develop elsewhere in the continent, for example, around Globo. The traditional analog media companies are going to have to change their model to embrace digital. And that still hasn't happened. It's still, Latin America still is a more than a, a heavily weighted traditional analog set of markets. Okay, but what is the best business model that you would advise for Latin America in terms of outsourcing creativity or tech services in, in, in the likes well, of Globant, for instance? Yeah, no, I can, I can talk about you know, our model. So we started four years ago. The, the traditional holding company model is not a model that, you know, I, I've had two previous existences to S4. One was at Sarches, where I was CFO for seven years where we built that into the largest advertising and marketing company. And then at WPP, which I started in 1985 with a partner, and then left in 2018, which also became the largest advertising and marketing services company. Not, not, not any longer, it's number four. Amazingly, it's number four by market cap. Now the biggest is Omnicom, the second is Publicis, the third is IPG, and WPP is fourth. But those models, I didn't create them. Uh, neither did Maurice Levy at Publicis, neither did John Ren at Omnicom. It actually started with IPG into public group and a man called Marion Harper in the 1950s. And the model was a multi-brand model, usually for conflict. You know, you couldn't handle Unilever, Procter and let's say Colgate in the same channel, in the same brand. So you had multi-brands in order to handle conflict. That was a model that developed 70, 80 years ago and is no longer fit for purpose. In a world where digital is 60, 65% of spend, it no longer operates in a 24-7 always on world. It no longer oper operates, in my view, at the best level. So when we started S4, Four years ago, our objective, our mission, was to create a new model and disrupt the old model because we don't think the old model is fit for purpose in a 24-7 always-on world. And there were, to answer your question, there were four fundamental principles. One is we would focus solely on digital. You know, digital the digital tail was now wagging the dog even four years ago. It now is the dog. It's going to be, as I said, 75% of, of total spend by 2025. So critically important. That's number one. The second is data. You know, my colleagues in the industry uh, look back you know, to the era of Mad Men and Don Draper, in my view, with rose-tinted spectacles. They often say that data destroys creativity. I don't believe that. I think data improves creativity. So our model is a data-driven model, not one that produces perfect 15 second, 30 second, 60 second TV commercials, which take, by the way, two or three months to produce. But you produce, and I think you know, the best example I can give you, it's still a model that I think resonates with me, is the Netflix model. You know, for example, when we work for Netflix and create um, advertising copy around a series, let's say it's Narcos 3 or whatever, we will produce something like 1.6 million different executions. We might only use 50 to 70,000, but we know that Matthias follows football. And we'll serve him a piece of content that compares Narcos 3 to football or Rubble plate. Team. And we see what his reaction is, if he doesn't react in the right way, and we know he, he, he's on wsj.com, likes business, we might serve him a piece of content that compares it to a business. But the idea is to find the connection with the consumer 
on an individualized basis. So that's the second principle. So continuous loop. It's rather like political advertising, but without an election date. That's number two. The third is the characteristics that we pursue. It, it's a very glib phrase, faster, better, cheaper. Faster is about agility. Every CEO that you meet always says that their, their organizations, I would say even about our own organization, is very agile and moves speedily. Little do they know. I mean, if they saw the things that we see within their own organizations, the inability, the bureaucracy, the, the, the multifunctional execution that prevents fast movement. So agility is key. Better is about understanding the digital ecosystem. And I just want to run through the digital ecosystem because it's really important, I think, to understand. I tried to explain those six constituents I mentioned before. But in addition to those, it's about Apple understanding the strengths and weaknesses of Apple and Microsoft, of Oracle, Adobe, and Salesforce, of IBM and SAP, of Twitter, Snap, Pinterest, LG, Samsung, Xiaomi, JD.com, Shopify, Netflix, Spotify, understanding the strengths and weaknesses because what we're interested in is the digital pie. We don't care at S4 or Media Monks where that, how that pie is sliced. What we are concerned about is the growth of that pie. So better is about understanding the digital ecosystem and then cheaper or being more efficient you know, the CMO of one of our largest clients said to me recently, a tech client, said, you have the best model, and I don't have to pay for all that useless overhead at the holding com companies. A harsh thing to say. The other, the CCO, the chief creative officer of another one of our tech clients, said to me, you're starting in production with your model, and you're building a network out of where you make the product. That, to his mind, was the best way of doing it. So that's faster, better, more efficient. And the fourth fundamental principle is a unitary structure. The problem with the holding companies is they are multi-branded. And those brands compete with one another to the detriment of the client. So we have 9,000 people in 32 countries now. About 65, 70% of our business is in the Americas, North and South America, 20% in EMEA and 10% in Asia. And then 60% of our business is content, digital advertising content, 30% is data and analytics and digital media, and 10% is tech services, the, the stuff that competes against a Globant or a, an Accenture Interactive or an EPAM or a Endava, those sort of things. So, that's, that's the, the, the thrust of what we're doing. So when you say to me, what's the model? From my perspective, that's the model. And you know, we report our third quarter results on Monday, and you'll see the progress that we've been making in, at a time when there's been pressure, the pressure that you mentioned in your first question uh, overall. Right. What's your opinion of Elon Musk's entrance into the ad industry? Well, you, you know, the first thing to say is you, 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 ne you never should bet, get, bet against Elon Musk. Uh, if, if any of you can watch, the BBC have produced three one-hour documentaries uh, called The Elon Musk Show. I think it's on the BBC iPlayer. Uh, I don't know how you can get at, to, at it, uh, but try and get at it because it really shows you. I mean, he is a phenomenon. One of his, um, his ex-employees worked at SpaceX. She was a woman who ran the, the uh, human resources for SpaceX, was asked on camera whether, you know, he was, whether Elon Musk is an Einstein. And she said, better than an Einstein. And I think it is. He is an extraordinary individual. Um, his ex-wife his ex uh, said to him, I think it was the woman that he was married to and divorced twice. Um, said, really interesting, she hopes that he will land on Mars in, in, by 2029. That's when he's trying to, to ensure that he lands on Mars. So exceptional individual, 
unparalleled, still probably the richest man on the planet, don't bet against him. But he had two big issues in my view. The first is advertisers don't believe in the platform at the moment and are taking a wait and see attitude. So important to understand the numbers. I said before, it's five and a half billion of revenue. He said before in his negotiation that he wanted to get their revenues up by five times to 25 billion, but he wanted to reduce the dependence on advertising from 100% to 50%. So if you do the maths, that he go, means he goes from 5.5 billion in advertising to 12 and a half billion. So he's talking about more than doubling. Remember what I said, the market for digital advertising is about 500 billion. So he's only 1% currently of digital advertising, and he's talking to, going, to go to about 2%. That is not impossible, but he has to get content moderation right. He's forming this moderation council, which is not dissimilar to the sort of thing that Zuckerberg has done at Facebook, but it's absolutely critical to get the confidence of the advertising clients and the advertising community. That's one. The second thing is he's fired a lot of people in a somewhat indiscriminate way, and he has to get the confidence back of his people. Now, he has, if you watch the Elon Musk show, he has a following amongst his people at Tesla, at SpaceX, at the Boring Company, and, and other, other operations. He has a considerable employee constituency. So the answer to your question, Matthias, is I wouldn't bet against him. He will experiment. He already has on content, on the blue check, on the gray check. He will continue to experiment. And as he said on a tweet, I think, last night, there'll be things he does right and things he does wrong. But he, ultimately, I think he will be successful. Whether he'll get his money back or not, his 44 billion, I don't know. It seems to me it'll be difficult. But don't bet against him. But he has a number of challenge, challenges. Okay, talking about success, I'd like to get to your leadership advice. So you've accomplished a lot in the past. What motivates you to keep creating these huge businesses? Well, S4 is not huge. It's, it's uh, as I say, 9,000 people in 32 countries. Uh, we want it to be, that's from a standing start from zero four years ago. We want it to be even more successful. I mean, our clients are, you know, we have, we, we call, our, we, we sort of grade, our clients above $20 million of revenue a year, we call whoppers. Uh, we have already eight whoppers. You'll see what we've been doing uh, subsequently in the last quarter on Monday. So we continue to build bigger, 50% of our revenues come from the tech companies. Our biggest client is Alphabet Google. Our second biggest client is an NDA telecommunications company, but you might guess who it is. It's probably one of the most valuable companies on the planet. Not probably, it is. And third would be Meta. So it gives you an idea of the sort of companies that, that we work with. I mean, um, I'm really interested in developing new executions. And the, the biggest issue, and I, we had just a conversation with one of our clients here in Mexico a few minutes ago, and the, the client said to me, what words of wisdom have you got? And I said, very little. Um, and he said to me, well, what, what's the, the biggest issue that our clients face, I think, and indeed that we face as an industry, is lack of integration. The, the alignment of objectives throughout the organization so that, you know, if you, if you would take a militaristic analogy, if you think of a company as an army, if you can align everybody in that company to the same objective, you have a, a hugely powerful machine. And the biggest issue that our clients have, and you know this, I'm sure everybody in this room is perfectly aligned and everybody works seamlessly together. And when any of your individual people get a, uh, ask you to help, everybody drops everything and, and works in a totally seamless, but you are the exceptions that prove the rule. That is not the rule. 
an aligning purpose, an aligning mission, an aligning implementation is the critical issue. If CEOs saw the things that we see in the day-to-day -day operation of their organizations, they would be horrified. And I think getting the alignment. So I, I'm fascinated by that. I, one other thing I would say, I think owner-managed companies, I know that Zuckerberg has come in, come in for great criticism recently by virtue of the fact that he controls the company. I think that's an asset. It's not a liability. The problem with most companies in the listed sectors, and I would say private equity companies, and even venture capital, venture capital may take a longer view, but private equity companies, average hold period for their investments is about three, four, or five years, too short term. And where you have an owner-managed company where the, the people who run the company own a significant chunk of it, you get much more alignment, I think, now, if you, if, I, if you said to me, what's the issue with the holding companies? I would say it's the lack of alignment, one of the problems, the lack of alignment between ownership and management. There's a separation, and I think that's a real problem. So the answer to your question is that for, I don't want to play golf. I don't want to retire. Um, I don't want to play cricket or go, or go, although I did stay up all night listening to England get into the, the final of the uh, T20. Um, I'm not going to Qatar for the whole of the World Cup. So I want to carry on doing this until um, the day I drop. Um, but it's really interesting in how you can adapt the model to the changed circumstances. There's this culture nowadays of um, testing, iterating, yeah. failing fast and learning from your mistakes. Sir Martin, what has been your greatest business mistake? The only one I publicly admitted to, there were plenty, um, was over leveraging. It's interesting in the context of what's going on at the minute. So I over leveraged. When we, when we um, acquired Ogilvy in 89, um, I took out, without wanting to be too complex, about a convertible preferred stock. So this was a, a part of the funding was half cash and half convertible preferred. And a convertible preferred in a slowdown in growth or a recession, which happened in 19, because we acquired Ogilvy in 89, and in 92 there was a recession, a real recession. Not globally, but in certain parts of the world. So not dissimilar to what we're seeing at the moment. I'll come on to it, just one thing I want to say about that in a second. Um, but that what, what I did was I took on debt, the, ca the cash element of it, but also the convertible preferred. As stock markets fall, you couldn't convert the preferred into it. So that was the biggest mistake. But I do want to say one thing and just trigger it in my mind. The, the, world, the world has changed radically, I think. You know, the last, you know, I've been at this since 19, really the end of the 1970s. So it makes me a very old man. But for the last 40 years, it didn't matter where you went. It, you know, as long as the demographics suited you, wherever you planted your flag as a global company, you were basically successful. That has changed radically. There are three big issues that we face. The first is the lack of relationship between US and China, the two most, most powerful economies in the world. And whether the Americans like it or not, China is going to be number two or might even become bigger, not on a per head basis, but may even become bigger. And the Americans are going to have to come to terms with that. That's number one. And it's diverging. Yeah, we'll go into the detail, but you see what Xi said this week. You see what Biden and Congress are doing this week. It's pulling it apart. So that's one thing. The second thing is Russia and the Ukraine. Even if there is a solution, to Ukraine, acceptable to both sides. The security of Europe is threatened and will continue to be threatened by President Putin and by Russia. So Eastern Europe will continue to be a problem. And the third thing is Iran and what, what the Iranians are going to do or not do. Those three things have created tremendous fragmentation. So as you think about your businesses, I think 
and we think about S4 and about Media Monks, our operating brand, we have to think about geography in a totally different way. I, I want to finish on a, a really positive note. I'm very bullish about North and South America. This sort of time zone that you have in North and South America, in that fractured world that I mentioned, is extremely powerful. The talent in South America, the technological talent, and the creative talent is as good as you will find anywhere in the world. We, you know, my colleagues in New York or my colleagues in London are very snooty, if you understand what the word snooty means, about the creativity and quality of the advertising and technological industries. It is as good in this part of the world as it is there. I would argue the creativity in some parts of Latin America even better than you would find elsewhere, and technology. You mentioned Globan, fantastic firm, you know, from roots in Buenos Aires. Mercado Libre would be another good example of it. There are other examples too. So number one is think, you're gonna have to think about the world in a much more fragmented world. I'm very bullish on North and South America, very bullish on the Middle East, because energy and oil prices are gonna to continue to remain high Africa is very volatile, but does offer some opportunity. And Asia, I'm gonna say ex-China. I don't mean ex-China. I mean, most of our clients have got big exposure to China, and they're gonna to have to moderate because the big issue is what are the Chinese gonna do about Taiwan? And does that pose a similar security threat to Asia and around China that we've seen with Ukraine and Russia, and maybe even beyond Ukraine. So those things mean that those parts of the world are going to be much more attractive. Europe, I'm quite negative on. We at S4 and Media Monks have to be bigger in Europe. We're doing well in Europe. It's our fastest growing region, but we have to do more. But generally, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the UK are very challenged economies, and I think will be for a long time. So that's one thing. The other final thing is technology is really important. So if you're you know, here in Latin America, you're well placed, particularly if you're focused on digital transformation. You mentioned Globant, I mentioned Globant, Accenture, EPAM, Endava. These are all companies, our, techno our technology services businesses, Zamoga based in, in Bogota and Theorem One in the US offer tremendous opportunity. But the world is a very, very different place. Okay, you mentioned a lot of unicorns. I'd like to get some tips out of you in terms of leadership. What do you think, if you had to outline a single factor for success, what would you say is, is the key factor? Is it hard work? Is it developing unique skills? Is it networking? Is it connections? What has worked for you? Um, all, all of the above. Um, in what order? <laughs> uh, it's so, so difficult. I mean, I'm the, the son of a Ukrainian, the grandson of a Ukrainian immigrant to the UK, or actually two Ukrainian immigrants to the UK on, on my father's side of the family and Polish and Romanian. So I'm half Ukrainian, a quarter Polish and a quarter Romanian. Um, so I think roots are very important. Um, my father gave me, I was an only child, spoilt only child, from the Northwest London Jewish ghetto in, in, in the UK. Um, so I was part of a community that was an immigrant community with tremendous pressures, you know, urge to succeed. My father gave me, he didn't have an education. He had to leave, he and my mother had to leave school at 13 uh, when they came with their parents from Eastern Europe. Um, and so they gave me a, I had the, the, the fortune of having a very good education at Cambridge and, and Harvard. I think that was really important. Networking, you mentioned, hard work. Luck is important. My father used to say, you make your own luck. There's something in that, but I think Good fortune is, so it, you know, the answer is there's no formula. It's, it's, I think the, actually, I think the, the biggest influence on me 
was the pressure cooker of um, that immigrant community. That, that's, now you see that in Latin America in various ways, but you see it in its most pronounced form in Europe. And of course now immigration, sadly, is one of the big, you know, my grandparents probably couldn't have got into the UK today. Wow. So points, there's a thing called the point system where you're, you're evaluated for immigration on the, you know, what your education, your qualification, they had nothing. You know, they fled the, the Holocaust or actually they fled in, in 1899. My grandfather said he cut off, we always thought he was exaggerating, but he said he cut off a Cossack's hand with a sharp sword when he was 10 years old. He said the Cossack put his hand across the barrier of the ghetto. <laughs> we think it was the Lvov, Lviv, or Kiev, Kiev, either one of those cities. He put his hand across and he chopped it off. Now, I always thought that was crazy, but given fast forward to today, quite possible. Okay, so I understand your drive right, right. now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Who is a business person you admired the most and, and why? My father. So um, he, he had no education. Um, 13 years old, leaves school, and he ends up running. Uh, it wasn't his own firm. It was part of an industrial holding company. Um, but he ended up running, it was the biggest retail chain in the UK in radio and TV uh, at, the, at the time. There were 750 stores in the UK. There were two other people that I admired a lot, um, you, who you won't know probably, a man called Arnold Weinstock, who ran General Electric in the UK, and the other one, Jules Thorne, Lord Weinstock, Sir Jules Thorne, uh, Jules Thorne ran a company called Thorne Electrical. He left Vienna, a Jew, from Vienna in the 1930s, and he set up an electrical light factory and then built a big radio, TV, electrical, brown goods, white goods company, manufacturing company in the UK. These were people, Weinstock was similar. I mean, Weinstock married the boss's daughter, <laughs> and ended up, ended up running the firm, which is another, well, another way of doing it. Um, but these were people, you know, today, who do, who do I, I mean, Musk you have to admire. Um, Bill Gates you have to admire. Um, Jack Welch in his day you would have to admire, although that's probably passed on. Satya Nadella, I think at Microsoft, has done a brilliant job of, of building. My, Tim Cook at Apple taking over from Steve Jobs, who, who uh, you know, was an a, iconic figure. I mean, Jobs and Musk, I think, you know, you, you can parallel those two. So those are the people. But going back, my dad, I would say, would be the one. Okay. One final question, probably the most important of them all. Who do you think is going to world, win the World Cup of soccer? England, Mexico, or Argentina? It's not, it's not going to be England. <laughs> Good. England might win against Pakistan on Sunday in, 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 in Sydney, if the weather holds out. Um, I think it's either, I'm, I'm in Latin America, so I have to be careful what I say. It's either Argentina or Brazil. Good. Artificial intelligence says it's Argentina, <laughs> and it hasn't failed so far. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here in Mexico. Thank you.